ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Thank Your Honor. Bring it to Council, stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. We continue with the stage case. Thank you, Your Honor. State would call Salvatore Cavalier, please. While he's coming in, may I approach the clerk, Your Honor? Yes. Salvatore Cavallari. Uh, I say no. D A T O R E. My name is Cavallari. C A V A L I E R E. Cavallari, you may have a seat in the witness block, please. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cavallari, uh, I'm going to draw your attention back to 2019, okay? In 2019, did you uh, own or rent property on Deercliff Road in Avon? I did. And specifically, what address? Uh, 376, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. What kind of property was that? Um, it's It was a 31-acre lot with a garage and a farmhouse on it. What part of that property uh, did you, I guess, have control over? Um, the garage. Where was the garage located? Um, right next to the road on uh, Deer Cliff. Did you have any video surveillance on that garage? Yes, I did. What was the video surveillance? Could you please, please explain? Um, I had a uh, night owl uh, security system. I had two cameras on the outside of the building, uh, one on the gable end and one in the soffit. What areas did those video cameras encompass? Um, one camera, the one on the gable end, was parallel to Deer Cliff Road and got um, traffic coming at it and away from it. And then on the um, soffit, it was more perpendicular with the road and kind of got everything going left and right, but more of a side view versus head on. Did you have those video cameras in place on May 24th, 2019? Yes. Was that camera system internet based or hardwired into the property? Internet. Was the video or camera surveillance system a continuous stream or motion activated? Continuous. And do you know if the time was accurate? I believe it was, yes. And at some point, did you meet with detectives regarding your video camera? I did. Did you provide them with the video camera system? Yes, I did, the hard drive. Okay. And did you get your hard drive back? Yes, I did. Okay. May I just have a moment? Yes. Uh, states 123, Your Honor, I would ask to move into evidence. I don't believe there's any objection at this time. Stage 123, admitted as full. Sir, just a couple of questions. With respect to 376 Deer Cliff Road, is that in any way located near Jefferson Crossing in Farmington? Yeah, I would say approximately a mile, mile and a half down the road. By down the road, is it south or north or 
Um, north, I would say, towards Hartford direction. Uh, states 123. Just going to open a map behind you, sir, if you could. Just is 376 Deer Cliff Road on that map? Yes, it is. If you could, wouldn't you mind please standing up and pointing to it? And Jefferson Crossing. Thank you. You can have a seat, sir. Your your seat's going to open states 9, 123, file marked 376 Deer Cliff, 1757 Fraught. Sir, if you could take a look at the screen behind you. Um, what are we looking at? That would be the, um, the soffit and camera on the front of the garage. Um, and that would be Deer Cliff Road at the top of the screen. So the white part on the right side of the screen is at the garage? Yes, it is. Okay. And Deer Cliff, you said it is at the road going from the upper left to the right of the screen? Correct. Uh, Jefferson Crossing, is that towards the left side of the screen or towards the right side of the screen if you were? Um, that would be to the left side. Okay. Just gonna... Maybe a clip. And then you indicated, sir, you had one other camera? Yes. Uh, state's going to play file mark 376 Deer Cliff, 1757 side. And again, sir, what are we looking at? Uh, that would be the camera on the gable end of the garage uh, facing Deer Cliff. And that road going from the left to the bottom right at this point, is that Deer Cliff? Yes, it is. And Jefferson Crossing, where would that be on the left or the right side of the screen? Uh, it would be on the top left. Okay. Now on the upper left, there is the date and time, uh, 5-24-2019 and then 17-57. Uh, is that correct time, sir? I believe so, yes. Okay, I'm just gonna hit play. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Nothing further. No questions. Cavalier, you can use that. Thank you, sir. You're on the state calls for Val your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Pablo Gomez. P-A-W-E-O. G-U-M-I-E-N-N-Y. Okay, sir, you may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Gamini. I'm just going to ask that you keep your voice up so that every member of the jury can hear you, okay? okay. 
Mr. Gamini, um, first of all, are you nervous being here? Yes. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Poland. Where in Poland? Um, in, I don't know how to explain, near Krakow. <clears throat> it's a small town. And how old are you, sir? I am 43. What year did you come to the United States? 2000. In 2000. Are you married? Yes. Do you have children? I have two children, 13 and 16. And where do you currently reside? In uh, Sinsbury. Are you residing at the uh, same residence that you resided at in 2019? Yes. What is that address, sir? 27 Springbrook. <clears throat> I'm sorry? 27 Springbrook. Okay. I'm just going to ask again if you could just keep your voice up just a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> what do you do for a living? I'm a carpenter. And how did you begin to work as a carpenter? When I moved here in um, 2000, this is where I started doing it. When you moved here in 2000 and started working as a carpenter, were you working for a particular contractor? Yes, I started working for a, for a small company. What was the name of the company? Dream Builders. What type of work did Dream Builders do? Framing. And when you say framing, what do you mean? It's the, um, the structure of the house. And did you have any experience with this in Poland? No. So you kind of learned it when you got here? Yeah. How did you get the job? Uh, through some friends. And how long did you work for that company? Is it Dream Builders? Yes. Um, I think I, I stopped working there around 2008 or nine. When you were working for Dream Builders, did you do anything besides framing houses? Um, yeah, I was doing like small side jobs. What types of side jobs? Um, like windows replacement, doors replacement, um, decks and that kind of stuff. Now you indicated that you came to the United States in 2000. Have you been back to Poland since 2000? Yes. How many times? Uh, I believe like three or four. And have you traveled with your family back to Poland? Yes. Incidentally, were your children born here, born here or were they born in Poland? They were born here. You mentioned that you were working for Dream Builders from 2000 until approximately 2008, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever, uh, during that time period, meet someone named Fotis Dulos? Yes. <clears throat> approximately what year did you meet him? I want to say around 2004. How did you meet him? I met his sister first. She was uh, managing she, his uh, job sites. She was architect by trade. Um, and shortly after I met Fotis. What was Mr. Julius's sister's name? Rena. That's how they started the company. F-O-R-E, four group, Fortis and Rena. <clears throat> and can you just, uh, when, what's the name? Four, four group. No, no, the, the sister's name, I'm sorry. Rena. Oh. And uh, did you meet her through your work at Dream Builders? Yes. Was Mr. Dulos's sister uh, an owner of four group at that point? I'm not sure. I think they were co-owners or I'm, I'm not sure the details. And so did Dream Builders do work for Four Group? Buddy, so yes. Did you do work for Four Group as part of Dream Builders? I was working paid by Dream Builders and Dream Builders was building a, uh, framing a house for Four Group. Okay. And was this again in approximately 2004? I believe so, yeah. How many, um, well, strike that. Did Dream Builders do any other projects with Four Group over the years? Yes. How many would you say approximately? 
can't remember. So were you an employee of Ford Group while you were framing houses for Dream Builders? No. Now at some point, did you leave Dream Builders? Yes. What year was that? I think around 2008 or nine. And why did you leave Dream Builders? I wanted to start my own work. And by start your own work, what did you do? I start framing. What was the name of your company? Yeah, I was just working under my name. Did you have any employees? No. How would you get work? Um, through people that I that I knew. Did you do any work for Four Group as uh, your own company? Yes. Incidentally, were you keeping in touch with Mr. Julos during this time period? What do you mean, what time period? So um, from the time that you worked at Dream Builders until approximately 2010 when you started your own company, were you in contact yes. with Mr. Julos? Yes, yes. Lotus would call me every, every now and then, you know, like install a door or do this or do that, like small jobs here and there. And so for how long did you have your own framing company? Um, I was working under my own name until uh, 2016 when I, uh, when I started working for, for group on the books. What was significant about 2016 when you began working? I, uh, I got my green card. Now you indicated that Mr. Julius would call you to do odd jobs. Did you also frame any houses for Ford Group during yes. that time period? Yes. How many houses would you say you framed? Uh, I can't remember. Eight, ten. And what was your relationship with Ford Group at this point? Were you a subcontractor? Yes. Did there come a point in time where Mr. Dulos offered you a job at Ford Group? Yes. And what year was that? So I started working um, as an employee in 2016. But <coughs> prior to that, I think around mid-2014, um, he'll have me like uh, help other managers manage the projects. And I think in 2015, I was, I was um, I was managing projects by myself. And were you still um, framing houses on your own time as well? Or were you pretty much dedicated to Ford? I was pretty much dedicated to, to Ford Group. And you mentioned managing projects. Can you just explain to the members of the jury what you mean by that? So it's a whole process of um, building a house from, from clearing the, the land to foundation, um, building the house to all the way finish to basically to when your new owners can move in. Managing every aspect of that work. Did that include uh, putting out bids for subcontractors as well? Yes. Did you ever meet someone named Jennifer Dulos? Yes. When did you meet her approximately? Shortly after I met Floris. <clears throat> so uh, around 2004? Yes. And Mr. Dulos and Jennifer were married, is that correct? I think so. When you met Mr. Dulos and Jennifer, where were they living, if you recall? Um, I think they were living in a1. I don't remember the address. And did you ever meet any of the Dulos children? Yes. How old were the children when you met them? Well, I, got, I was, I was kind of meeting them. Um, I, I don't remember. I, 
like they were they were little, but okay, so they were young young yeah. children. All right. Were any of them born actually since you met Mr. Dulos? Yes. And um, did you ever have opportunities to interact with Jennifer Dulos occasionally? Yes. How would you describe her? She was a good person, um, delicate, nice, friendly. Now, did there come a point in time where um, the Dulos has moved to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Do you remember approximately when that was? No. Where was Four Group's office located prior to Fort Jefferson Crossing? I believe it was uh, Five Charlotte Court. Um, I don't remember the, the time, but it was prior to. And then did the office move to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Above the garage, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever, um, well, firstly, did you have a desk in the office? Yes. And did you ever meet someone named Lauren Almeida? Yes. How did you meet Lauren Almeida? She was a babysitter for, for Dulos family. Did she do anything else for the Dulos family? I think at some point she was um, doing like a punch list and, and maybe tried to manage some of the projects. As an employee of Four Group? Yes. Now, um, did you ever do uh, odd jobs for Jennifer around Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes, a lot. What types of things would you do for Jennifer? Pretty much anything uh, to do with the house. Um, she would call me, um, you know, as simple as replace a light bulb to, you know, I remember I was building a swing set on the back for the kids. Um, I would drive her a lot to Boston Airport or Things like that. That's... You mentioned that you would uh, drive her a lot to the airport. What vehicles would you drive her in? Um, I'm not sure, but I think my, mainly it would be the Suburban. Suburban have a little bit more space? When we were driving with the kids, then we would take the Suburban. Now, did there come a point in time when you met someone named Michelle Traconis? Yes. Do you see Ms. Traconis in the courtroom? Yes. Would you just point her out and uh, tell us what color shirt she has on? Uh, gray. Judge, you identified the defendant. Thank you. Now, there, there came a point in time when Jennifer moved out of Fort Jefferson Crossing, correct? Yes. Did you meet the defendant before or after Jennifer moved out of Fort Jefferson Crossing? I believe after. Do you remember approximately when that was? No. Do you remember approximately how long after Jennifer moved out you met her? No, I, I can't recall it. And when you um, met the defendant, where did you meet her? I believe she walked into the office with uh, with photos. And how would you describe her at that point? Objection, they sustained. Well, was she friendly? Yes. You mentioned that Jennifer moved out at some point. I want to uh, direct your attention now to Mr. Dulos and Jennifer's relationship. Did there come a point in time when uh, Mr. Dulos indicated to you that he and Jennifer were going to be separating? Yes. Do you remember when that was? I remember we were having a team meeting in the office and then uh, he announced it to everybody that they're, they are separated. Was Jennifer still living in the house at this point? Yes. And did Jennifer ever make any requests from you during that time period? Yes, she would. Um, um, asked me to move some of the stuff from her house to um, her family owned the house, I, I think it was Palm Bridge. 
house on a lake. So she would ask him a number of times to move some things from her house to, to the lake house. And would you do that for her? Yes. Why? Because I like her and I wanted to help out. Did you tell Mr. Dulos that you were doing this? No. Why not? At some point I told Jennifer that I have to stop doing that because this is going to get me fired. How did she react when you told her that? Uh, first she joked, she said, uh, that's okay, so I'll help you to go and uh, renovate the house. I'm going to object it's hearsay. <coughs> well, it's, if it's a joke, I, I don't see how it's offered for its truth, Judge. Oh, well, then I'll withdraw the objection. What did she joke? She said, that, then I'll have you uh, renovate my house in Palm Beach. But after that conversation, did you ever move anything for her again? I don't think so, no. Incidentally, um, you mentioned that you had driven Jennifer in the Suburban. Did you ever drive her in your Tacoma? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that? Yeah, so uh, I think shortly prior to the voice, um, she um, bumped into something with her Range Rover. And uh, she asked me if I could get some paint and touch up the bumper so Dulos wouldn't see it. Um, and I said that I have a friend who's a mechanic um, who lives in Ibrahim and he can like fix the bumper and make it look like never ever happened for like $400. And she said, okay, so, uh, so this is when I drove my truck and she drove the Range Rover to Ibrahim. And then once we left the Range over there. I give a right in my truck back to Fort Jefferson. And you indicated that this was prior to the divorce, so I want to just clear this up. This was prior to her moving out of the house, correct? Yes. And can you recall any other time she was ever in your Tacoma? When um, when I drove her back to pick up the, the Range Rover. Sure, other than that particular interaction. I don't recall it. Did Mr. Dulos ever talk to you about his divorce with Jennifer? Mm -hmm. you, like, can you rephrase the question? What do you mean by that? Well, did Mr. Dulos ever indicate to you how the divorce proceedings were going or anything like that? Yes. What types of things would he say? Um, He would say, like, uh, you know, I'm going to object only uh, not to the hearsay. I'm going to object to it without a time frame. I mean, apparently, this went out for a while. Well, the question was, did he ever talk to this witness about the divorce? Now, the court uh, does not know uh, what counsel's uh, frame is: the filing of the divorce, the proceedings after the filing. Perhaps you can sharpen the question. Yes, sir. Never get it. Mr. Gamini, did Mr. Dulos ever talk to you about picking up his children in New Canaan and whether or not there were any cameras at Jennifer's house? Um, I'm going to object to the. It's a complex question with two <clears throat> portions. Well, well I'm, I'm trying to. I was, I was asked to sharpen the question, so I'm trying to do that. Uh, the question has been sharpened, but there are two points. Sure. So if you can just ask one point at a time. Did Mr. Dulos ever uh, speak with you or anyone else in your presence about cameras at Jennifer's home in New Canaan? Yes. Approximately when was that conversation? I don't remember exactly. Um, I think it was like a month or two prior to Jennifer's disappearance. Where did this conversation take place? In the office. Was anyone else present for this conversation? Yes. Who was present? Dan Zeisler. Who is Dan Zeisler? It's an audio video guy. <clears throat> I'm sorry? 
contractor who does audio and video. Specializes in. So sort of a subcontractor for four groups? Yes. <clears throat> Tell the jury exactly what was said during this conversation. So I believe I was. Yeah, I'm um, object on hearsay grounds. Well, uh, first, <clears throat> what was said in the conversation is, as the court understands it, is going to involve three people. So that question is quite broad. Let me uh, see if I can ask another question, Judge. So I'll withdraw the previous question. When um, this conversation took place, were you present for the entirety of the conversation? Or did you walk in on it? I'm not sure if I walked in and I, if I was sitting in, in, uh, in the office and they walked in. I, I don't recall it. And when they walked in, could you hear what Mr. Dulos was saying to Mr. Zeisler and what Mr. Zeisler was saying to Mr. Yes. Dulos? What was Mr. Dulos saying to Mr. Zeisler? He showed him um, hearsay. If I may judge, this yes. is not being offered for its truth. Rather, it's being offered to show the apparent concern that Mr. Dulos had over Jennifer potentially having cameras. So I'm not offering it to prove the truth of the matter asserted, but merely the fact that he was concerned that she had cameras is what's probative in this case. The problem, of course, is what Mr. Dulos's uh, internal motive was for making hearsay statements is not before the court here through this witness, and therefore it is an inappropriate question of this witness. I will also note that it's, at this point, it's also, because it's hearsay, it's certainly irrelevant to my client, if this was Mr. Dulos's case, that would be a different story. As the court knows, we have charged Mr. Dulos with committing the crime of murder, and the defendant is charged with conspiring with him to commit that crime of murder. This is directly probative to that issue, whether or not a conspirator committed an overt act. Still hearsay in this trial. Well, first, the court addresses whether it is hearsay. It is hearsay. Now, the next question is whether or not there is an exception, and the court would indicate that under the code, well, first, the court is going to just make clear, generally, what is the purpose of the hearsay rule? The purpose of the hearsay rule is to keep out of evidence statements or assertions by a declarant that could be considered or would be considered untrustworthy or unreliable. That's the purpose of the hearsay rule. The code has carved out exceptions to the hearsay rule. One of those exceptions is essentially called the residual exception to the hearsay rule. And the residual exception to the hearsay rule requires that the hearsay have indicia of reliability. It doesn't fall within the named exceptions to the hearsay rule, but it stands essentially as somewhat of a catch-all. If there is indicia of reliability, the court may admit it. So, counsel, other than simply the charge, what uh, is the uh, indicia of reliability? Well, Judge, respectfully, I, I disagree that this is being offered for a hearsay purpose. If, they, if I may proffer, the evidence is going to be that Mr. Dulos was asking whether or not a particular object. Well, I'm going to object to him well, proffering and answering it when I've objected to the testimony in the first place. Well, well, I, well, the court's question is, what is the indicia of reliability? That presumes the court has found that this is hearsay. Counsel has stated it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. The court does not know what the content of the conversation was. 
Perhaps the jury needs to be excused. Yes, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to take up a legal question. Please do not discuss the case. Well, if the question is, uh, what was that conversation? The court uh, understands that question to mean the conversation in which Fotis Dulos was a participant. What did Fotis Dulos say? This is just an example. Well, he said he wanted to know where the cameras were at 69 Wells Lane or wherever Jennifer Dulos was living at the time. Is that offered for the truth of the matter asserted? Counsel. May I, perhaps I can make an offer of proof to the witness? Yes. Mr. Gumini, um, I'm just going to ask these questions outside the presence of the jury so the judge can make a legal determination, OK? Can you um, tell uh, Judge Randolph what Mr. Dulo said to Mr. Zeisler in your presence? Yes, he showed him pictures on his phone of uh, um, Jennifer House, and he was asking him if this is camera, if this is camera, if this is camera. And what did Mr. Zeisler say? I don't remember. Um, I believe he said no. Okay. And then. Did you at some point enter the conversation as well? Yes, I, I told him um, that I don't I don't think those are cameras, but I, I told him, uh, you know, if Jennifer wants to record you, she can purchase one of those uh, small square cameras and, and place it anywhere. Just basically don't do anything stupid to it, you know. And um, was he concerned about Picking up the children, was that his concern, if you recall? I don't recall it. Okay. So that, that would pretty much be the offer, Judge. And if I may, you know, as I indicated, this is not being offered to prove the truth of any fact asserted. In fact, Mr. Dulos is asking questions. Mr. Zeisler saying it's not a camera. I'm not offering that for the truth of the matter asserted. And then Mr. Gumini chimes in and says, well, she can record you with just about anything. Don't do anything stupid. None of that is being offered to prove a fact, except it's probative to the issue of, was Mr. Dulos concerned that there were cameras at 69 Wells Lane, which of course is extremely probative for the jury to understand whether or not he was planning this crime. I think the evidence at this point, Judge, shows that this was a well thought out, executed crime in which a body has never been recovered, in which evidence was disposed of and discarded. So the fact that Mr. Dulos is asking about cameras in the month leading up to Jennifer Dulos' disappearance is relevant. It's not being offered for its truth, and the court, of course, can give a limiting instruction on the appropriate purpose to the jury to minimize any potential prejudice to the defense. But it's not hearsay, because I'm not offering it for its truth. So then it just becomes a question of relevance. Uh, so the question the court has, Attorney McGinnis, is would not the question, what was Fotis Dulos concerned about, avoid a hearsay objection? So I actually think, and I, I mean this respectfully, Your Honor, I actually think that that would draw a hearsay objection, because then I apparently would be offering it to show what he was, in fact, concerned about. There could be a state of mind exception with respect to that. But I want to just ask him, what Mr. Dulos was asking about. Certainly a question is not an assertion offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So our position is that this is a non-hearsay um, issue. It's just a question of basic relevance. And I think I've explained to the court why we believe that this is probative to the issue of uh, whether or not Mr. Dulos was planning on committing this offense. If I may respond brief yeah. briefly. First of all, this was the subject of a motion in limine on January 10th. This goes to the issue of hearsay. Now, 
I don't disagree with part of what Mr. McGinnis just said. It is true they have to prove that under the way they charge this, that Fotis Dulos committed an intentional murder. That's, but this isn't Mr. Dulos's trial. It is Ms. Traconis' trial. Therefore, the rules of evidence don't go out the window just because Mr. Dulos is not on trial. If he was, this conversation would clearly come in. But the fact that it becomes more difficult for them to pursue, they don't get to prove against my client what was in Mr. Dulos' mind based on saying that we can go get past the hearsay exception and allow a jury to conclude that Mr. Dulos was concerned about the fact of cameras. And with all due respect to um, uh, Mr. Gumieni, who was not even present for the whole conversation, it's snippets, and then he opined, but he didn't know, and he made up, and he said, um, as I just heard the testimony, anything can be a camera. So that's the problem with what I hear Mr. McGinnis doing. He is essentially saying, well, we have to prove something against someone who's not on trial, so we get to do all these things without having to consider the fact that the person who it's against is not on trial. The rules of evidence would still apply in this trial. I don't get to cross-examine uh, the, the, the uh, declarants, either Mr. I don't know about Mr. Zeisler, but certainly Mr. Dulos, so it's an, also a confrontation clause issue. How do I even address what was in someone else's mind when they're not here. So, well, Judge. before we proceed, the court sees this evidence this way. The court has already indicated it is hearsay. However, the court clearly sees an exception. The exception can fall into either, and the court uh, is not uh, electing this as the primary exception, the residual exception to the hearsay rule. But it's a statement by a co-conspirator in the course of and in furtherance of the conspiracy. It cannot be used to prove the conspiracy. It is a statement by a co-conspirator in the course of and in furtherance of the conspiracy. Now's the time then, because I filed a, both a motion and a memo. Under the law, the court has to make a separate finding that a conspiracy to commit a particular crime has been proven at this point. And that is the whole Counsel, point. How of can this. the court make a finding when the fact finder hasn't made a finding? The court must, under the law, make a finding that there is proof of a conspiracy before any of this is admissible under an exception, to, under that exception. The court the disagrees. I can bring the jury back in. Proceed, counsel. Yes, oh, Judge. first, would counsel stipulate? Yes, sir. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Committee, where we left off, um, I don't remember my exact last question, but we were discussing whether or not Mr. Dulos had ever discussed cameras at Jennifer Dulos's residence. Do you recall that question? Yes. When did this discussion take place? I want to say a month or two before the May 24th of 2019. And where did this conversation take place? Up in the office, for Boop's office. I apologize if I've asked these questions already, but um, who was present for this conversation? Dan Zeisler. 
It's an audio video contractor. And um, do you recall whether or not you were present for the entirety of the conversation? I'm not sure if I if I was sitting at the desk and they walk in or or they were in the office and I walked in. I, I'm but they were already talking? Yes. And what did you hear Mr. Dulo saying to Mr. Zeisler? Mr. Dulo <coughs> pulled out his phone and, and started showing uh, Dan Zeisler pictures of Jennifer um, home with uh, which I believe was um, motion detectors. <coughs> and starts asking him if those are cameras. And what did Mr. Zeisler say? I don't remember. I think he said they are not. And did you participate in the conversation yes. at all? What did you say? I said, I don't think so. I don't think those are cameras. Did you say anything else to Mr. Dulos? Yes, I researched it. Um, I recently saw a commercial of like a small square cameras, inch by inch. I believe they were called cop camera. And I, I showed him that and I said, you know, um, she can record you with anything. Just don't do anything stupid when you go there. And when you say don't do anything stupid when you go there, what were you referring to when you said when you go there? I don't know, like w whenever he was worried about. Now, um, I want to direct your attention to the spring of 2019, around that same time. Did Mr. Dulos have any dogs? Yes. How many dogs did he have? At some point he had two dogs. There was a um, uh, light brown, I, I think it's called Lab. And then uh, I think Jennifer had like a little dog, like a Chihuahua or something like that. And did one of the dogs get ill? Yes. Which one? Um, the the lab, the big one. Was the uh, lab still living at Fort Jefferson Crossing yes. at that point? If you could just let me just finish the question before you answer, okay? Was the lab still living at Fort Jefferson Crossing at that point? Yes. And did you did you actually end up taking the lab to the veterinarian? Yes. Did Mr. Julius go with you or did you take it on your own? I took it on my own. And uh, did there come a point in time when you spoke with Mr. Julius about the dog's health? Yes. Approximately how long after you took the dog to the vet was that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Approximately how long after you took the dog to the veterinarian was that? I don't remember exactly. I want to say a day or two after. And. Um, what did you say to Mr. Dulos? I asked him how is Beckham doing. And was anyone else present for this conversation? Michelle. When you say Michelle, you're referring to the defendant, correct? Yes. Where did this conversation take place? I believe it was um, I walked out of uh, the office door in between the garages, and they were standing there. And. What did Mr. Dulo say when you asked if Beckham was? He said that Beckham is ill and he's going to have to put him to sleep. And um, he said something like, uh, can you believe that Jennifer won't even let the kids come over and say goodbye to, to the dog before we put him to sleep? Did you respond to that comment? I don't remember. And you indicated that the defendant was present. Did she say anything at that point? Yes. Tell the jury what the defendant said. She said um, the she should be buried right next to this dog. And when you say she, what exactly did she say? Um, can I use bad words? Yes. She said that bitch should be buried right next to this dog. And what was her... Uh, demeanor like when she said this? I I think she was um, trying to cheer, cheer Dulos up. He was like heartbroken that, that his dog is about to be put down. How did he react when she said this? I believe he, he just looked at, look at her. <clears throat>
Now, in 2019, what type of vehicle did you own? Um, red Toyota Tacoma. How long had you owned that vehicle? I don't remember. I believe I bought the, bought the car in like 2012. And if it, what year was it? 2001. So it was a used vehicle when you purchased it? Yes. What condition was it when you purchased it? What do you mean by that? Well, was it, uh, I think everybody's probably bought a used car that wasn't in great condition. I mean, was it running? Was it? Yeah, it was, it was okay. And was this your only personal vehicle? Yes. Was it registered in your name or your wife's name? My wife's name. And would you use that vehicle for work-related things? Can you repeat the question? Would you use that vehicle for work-related things? Yes. Did you have any side jobs in 2019? Yes. What type of side job did you have? I would do like decks, small roofs, um, some siding repairs, window replacement, things like that on the weekends. And with specifically with respect to the Tacoma, did you have any side jobs for which you used the Tacoma? Yes, snow blowing. And was your Tacoma modified in any way to account for the snow plow? Yes. Tell the jury how it was modified. I, um, I have a... Um, it's called snow plow mount. It's, it's basically a um, big metal piece underneath the front bumper that the snow plow attaches to. And would you leave that on the Tacoma even yes. not in the winter months? Yes. Now, I want to turn back to Four Group. What was your official title with Four Group when you joined them in 2016? Project manager. And approximately how many projects would you say you would manage at any given time while working for Four Group? Um, mostly one at a time, sometimes those two. Where did Four Group own properties while you worked for them? Um, I'm not sure if we, Ford Jefferson was owned by Ford Group or it was, it was not, um, but I know they own 585 Dirk Cliff, 80 Mountain Spring Road, and 61 Sturbridge Hill Road. How about 88 Mountain? 88 Mountain? Yes. And um, also they had built the house at 77 Mountain Spring Road, is that correct? That's across the street from 80? Yes, sir. Yes. Were you a part of that build at all? No. How many project managers work for Four Group? Over what time, Your Honor, Jack? Uh, from your time working for Four Group beginning in 2016 until 2019, did the number of project managers vary? Yes. And at any given time, how many project managers were there as a minimum? One. And so were you always a project manager for Four Group? Between 2016 and 2019? Yes. Yes. And who, who were some of the other project managers during that time period? Um, Andy Loomis, Stefan Reich, Guillaume Bidelet, Matt Byrne. I think Lauren or Maddie at some point. And would some of these project managers leave four group and come back and was what was the dynamic like? Um No, I think I don't think anybody was leaving and coming back now. Okay, so if they left, they left. Yes. How did Mr. Dulos treat you as his employee? Okay, the thing with him was, you know, he was very um, hard-headed. He didn't like people. They say no to him. That's the easiest way to say. Well, did you enjoy working for Four Group? It was, yeah, it was a good job, good pay. 
Why did you like working there? I like to, I like to do that kind of stuff. When you say that kind of stuff, you mean manage projects? Building houses, manage projects. You indicated that Mr. Julos could be hard-headed. Did there come a point in time where you built your own house? Um, I renovated. And that's the house that you currently live in? Yes. And uh, did you ever have any discussions with Mr. Dulos about whether or not Ford Group would be a part of that renovation? He offered me help, yes. Did you accept his help? No, I refused it. Why? Because I want my house to be done the way I wanted to get it done. <laughs> I don't want him to say that you got to do things this way or that way, like he was very stubborn about things. Did you ever socialize with Mr. Julius outside of work? No. And I'm using socialize in the broadest terms. Did you ever attend Greek Easter at his house? Yes. How often? Um, I want to say I went there two or three times. Do you recall what years you went to Greek Easter at Mr. Julius's house? Could have been 2017, 18, and 19. Why did you go to Greek Easter? He was inviting everybody. Did your wife attend? Mm, I think once. Did you feel sorry for Mr. Dulos at any point? And that's why you attended Greek Easter? Objection. Relevance. Relevance, counsel. Well, the relevance, Judge, is that it provides the reason why Mr. Gumini went to Greek Easter in the first instance. It explains his presence. And I, if I may proffer, he's going to indicate that he went because Mr. Dulos's family was not present. Well, still not relevant. That question by itself is not relevant. The court is not foreclosing the avenue. It's the same. When you went to Greek Easter in 2019, were any of Mr. Dulos' children present? 2019? Yes, sir. No. Was Jennifer Dulos present? No. Did he ever tell you whether or not they would be present? I think he mentioned that to me that, um, that Jennifer won't let the kids um, come to Easter because Michelle and her family is there. Now, what days of the week did you work at Ford Group? Monday to Friday. What were your typical hours? Eight to five, but it wasn't set hours. I was basically given a project and, and you know, if, if I was there from nine to six or, or eight to five or seven to four, it, it, it didn't matter. <clears throat> Mr. Julius wasn't clocking your time, in no. other words? Is that correct? That's correct. Were you a salaried employee? Yes. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Julius's priority was simply that the project be completed on time? Yes. And so whether you worked 35 hours or 40 hours in a given week didn't yes. really matter to him. Is that fair to say? Correct. Now, you mentioned that you um, renovated a house in Simsbury. How many times did, well, firstly, let me ask it this way. Did Mr. Julius ever go to your house? Yes. How many times? Twice. Did you consider Mr. Julius to be a close friend? No. He was your boss? Yes. You mentioned your personal vehicle, the Toyota Tacoma. Did Ford Group own any vehicles in 2019? Yes. Tell the jury what vehicles Ford Group owned. It was white Jeep Cherokee, um, Chevy Suburban, and uh, Ford Raptor. And where would these vehicles be kept? At Fort Jefferson. Now, in terms of the vehicles themselves, specifically the four group vehicles, when you would go to a job site, would you use your personal vehicle or would you use a four group vehicle? Four group vehicle. 
And where would you get the Ford Group vehicle? At Ford Jefferson. Working at Ford Group, when would you typically take possession of a Ford Group vehicle? Monday morning. And so if you take possession of a Ford Group vehicle on Monday morning, how long would you have it for? For the whole week until Friday afternoon. Why would you hang on to a, a Ford Group vehicle for the entire week? So I could leave straight from uh, Simsbury, from my house, to, uh, to the job site, to New Canaan, without, without stopping by the office. And you mentioned New Canaan. Was Ford Group working on a project in New Canaan in May of 2019? Yes. What project was that? 61 Sturbridge Hill. If you uh, took possession of a Ford Group vehicle for the entire week, where would you leave your vehicle? At Ford Group, at Ford Group office, Ford Jefferson. Would you use the same Ford Group vehicle each week? It, it varied sometimes. Tell the jury why it would vary. I like to drive the Jeep and, uh, and I believe Michelle would like to drive the Jeep and, and Fortis wanted me to drive the Jeep because it was better on gas and, and I guess he didn't want me to put that kind of mileage on the Ford Raptor, which was more expensive vehicle. But were there times where you would take the Raptor? Yes. What would be a situation in which you would take the, the Raptor for work? If I need some, need to move some bigger um, items that were delivered to Fort Jefferson, like toilets, vanities, stuff that wouldn't fit in the Jeep. And where would you leave your Tacoma key during the work week? Um, there was drawer in the kitchen or at my desk up, up in the office. Now you mentioned that you would drive straight to projects. Did you ever return to the Ford Group office during the week? Sometimes. Why would you go back to the Ford Group office during the week? Some paperwork, invoices, um, basically to you know, touch bases with doulas about project and things like that. If you return to the office during the week, would you take your Tacoma home or would you continue to take the Raptor or whatever vehicle you were using? I would continue to take whatever vehicle I was using. Now, in May of 2019, was your Tacoma experiencing any mechanical difficulties? Yes. Tell the jury what mechanical difficulties your vehicle was experiencing. Um, so the truck has, uh, Trouble starting, um, was leaking oil, I believe, from power steering. Um, the check engine light that was on, it, it had multiple problems. Did Mr. Dulos ever drive your Tacoma? Yes, he did. How do you know? Um, I would find like uh, Starbucks coffee cups in it, um, and and I was telling him not to drive it because the you know the car was having mechanical problems, and I was concerned that he's gonna get an accident or something. On your insurance. Yes. Did Mr. Dulos ever call you about any mechanical issues with your Tacoma? Yes. When was that? I don't recall the exact day. I want to say about um, two weeks prior to May 24. What did Mr. Julo say to you? He called me and, and he said that he can't start the truck. Um, how do you start it? What's wrong with it? And I told him it's the starter, really. He asked me if it's the battery, if the battery is not good. I said, no, just keep turning the key. My start is to start earlier. Did you express to him not to drive your vehicle at that point? Prior to that. So were you surprised when he was calling you asking how to start the vehicle? Yeah, he wouldn't listen. He would drive it anyways. Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned earlier to the jury that your Tacoma was leaking oil in May of 2019? Yes. For approximately how long it had been leaking oil? I want to say I discovered it about a month earlier. Did you tell Mr. Dulos that the vehicle was leaking oil? Yes. Why did you tell him that? Because I don't want to stay in his driveway. And when you told Mr. Dulos that your vehicle was leaking oil, what, if anything, did he say back to you? He said, let's park it in the garage or on the grass area, it's fine, but let's park it in the garage. So at that point, he did not ask you not to park the car at Fort Jefferson Crossing, correct? No. You had mentioned that you were working on a project at 61 Sturbridge in New Canaan. Yes. What type of property was 61 Sturbridge? Residential. And what type of work was Ford Group doing at that location? Building a house. And when you say building a house, there was a house already there, is that correct? Yeah, that house, um, Ford Group demolished that old existing house <clears throat> and built, built a new one. And were there any subcontractors working on that property as well? Meaning when? In May of 2019, were there any <coughs> subcontractors that Ford Group was paying to do work at the house? Yes. <coughs> Tell the jury which subcontractors those were. Uh, I don't remember. I, there was a painter, um, gutter guy, I believe siding guy, um, landscaping guy. And what were your responsibilities with respect to that particular property? I was managing it. And how many days a week were you there? Most of the days. How long had you been managing the project for in May of 2019? Since the beginning. <clears throat> so probably for a year. And did you do any work on the property as well? Yes. What type of work would you do? Um, like installing mirrors, um, door hardware. <clears throat> I believe I cut down big tree on, on front of the property. Um, that kind of stuff. Was, was that typical in your role as a project manager to do smaller jobs like that? No. Why are you doing it on this particular property? I like to spend time on a, uh, on a job site and just might as well being there. And do you remember approximately how many other projects Ford Group was working on in May of 2019? I believe that was the only one. There was some bidding at 88, but uh, the work hasn't begun yet. And was 61 Sturbridge the only project that you were working on at that point? Yes. Now, did there come a time when Mr. Dulos asked you to move your vehicle to 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. Tell the jury how that happened. Um, I believe he called me, um, I'm not sure about the date. Um, it was at the day when uh, Stefan Rage and, and uh, his girlfriend came in for dinner. And um, he called me and, and asked me if I was coming down to the office and if we, if we could move uh, the Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road. And I believe you indicated you can't recall the date, but you recall Stefan Reich and his girlfriend? Yes. Where were they present? When um, when I came back from 80 Mountain Spring Road with Dulos in the Raptor, <clears throat> and then I was pulling out of Fort Jefferson Crossing, I believe Stefan pulled in with his car, and we, we talked for a minute. 
Now, I want to talk to you about this for a second. You indicated that you came back from 80 Mountain Spring Road with the Raptor. Yes. Um, I want to direct your attention now to the week of May 20th, 2019, Monday, May 20th. Did you have the Raptor for that particular work week? You mean May 20th, the whole week? Yes. Yes. And do you recall when you picked up the Raptor? I believe it was like a week prior to that. So May 13th? Yes. Why did you have the Raptor for two entire weeks? I don't remember. I think it had something to do with, uh, with moving uh, door slab from one of the contractors to, to 61 Sturbridge. So would it be fair to say then that you had the Raptor over the weekend of the 18th and 19th? Yes. Or to the best of your recollection? Yes. Did Mr. Dulos tell you why he wanted the Tacoma move to 80 Mountain Spring Road? No. Was that the uh, first and only time you were ever asked to move the Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. Where did you meet up with Mr. Dulos to do this? I pulled into Fort Jefferson, the garage door was open and, and, and he was ready to, to leave. When you say he was ready to leave, where was he and where was your Tacoma? I believe my Tacoma was in the garage and I just pulled into the parking lot with the, with the doctor. And at some point did he leave Fort Jefferson Crossing with the Tacoma? Yes, he just told me to follow him. And did you follow him? Yes. And did you follow him in the Raptor? Yes. Approximately how far away is 80 Mountain Spring Road from Fort Jefferson Crossing? I want to say five minute drive. Not terribly far? No. Did the two of you head straight to 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. And did you drive one behind the other? I believe I was a little bit um, farther behind him. They took me some time to turn around or something, I don't know. Did you ever ask Mr. Julius why we're moving the Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road? No. Why not? I didn't, I thought it might be the, the, he was upset the oil is leaking in his garage. I don't know, I didn't ask. You indicated that you were following behind Mr. Dulos. Did you arrive at 80 Mountain Spring Road at approximately the same time that he did? Yes. And did you see him park your Tacoma? Yes. Can you describe for the jury how he parked the Tacoma? So he pulled in around the garage and um, turned the truck around like it's like he was ready to leave and park it on the side of the um, driver. The parking spot. And when you say ready to leave, did he back so, it? So the, the, the front of the truck was facing... Outward? Yeah. And after he parked the vehicle, what happened next? He got in a uh, Raptor and, and we drove back to Fort Jefferson. Now, did you ever... Uh, socialize with Mr. Dulos and the defendant Michelle Traconis at the same time? What do you mean by that? Let me uh, sharpen my question a little bit. Did you ever ride dirt bikes with the defendant and Mr. Dulos? Yes. Firstly, how long have you been riding dirt bikes for? Me personally, I, I learned when I was a kid. So, 35 years. And how did it come to be that you ended up riding dirt bikes with the defendant and Mr. Dulos? Can you rephrase the question? How did you, uh, how did that gathering end up happening? Did they invite you or what happened? Yes. Um, 
one of the days, um, I believe the first time I went for a ride, it was um, just with Doodles. Where did the two of you ride? At the um, Power Lines trail behind Fort Jefferson Crossing. For the beginners, it's probably a good time to take the morning recess. Ladies yes, and gentlemen, we will stand in our morning recess until 1135. Please do not discuss the case.
This Honorable Superior Court is now open and back in session. Please be seated. Thank you. Judge, before we proceed, um, I've got to put something on the record because um, I'm a little concerned. Um, I had filed uh, back on January 10th, I filed a, uh, uh, a uh, memorandum with my motion in limine about the hearsay of uh, Mr. Doulos, an other alleged co-conspirator. And um, I cited cases such as State versus Vesicchio, V-E-S-S-I-C-H-I-O, which itself relies on a Second Circuit case going back to 1969, Guinea, United States versus Guinea. Um, it's a Second Circuit case. And I know Your Honor disagrees, but I thought it was settled law in Connecticut that in, before any co-conspirator hearsay, alleged co-conspirator statements hearsay comes in under the exception, the court was required to make, to make specific up findings that are based on things besides the statements. In other words, the court excludes the statements and then determines whether or not there is a, um, a finding by a preponderance of the evidence, and the court must actually make that finding, uh, that there is a, a preponderance of the evidence independent of the hearsay, that the court must decide that first that a conspiracy existed, that the declarant and the defendant were participate, participants in the conspiracy, and that the statement was made in furtherance of the conspiracy. And I submit that so far that none of those things have been shown. The court has disagreed, but I need to put that on the record because, you know, if this has been the law of Connecticut since I think I started practicing, um, and the court is disagreeing, again, I, I don't know what to do other than again to move for a mistrial because I, I just don't know what to do. Other than well, counsel. You've been in practice for many years. If the court were to determine there was a conspiracy, how could you argue at the time the state rested its case for a motion for judgment of acquittal when the court has already found a conspiracy? Well, that's, that's a good point. But first, it's by a fair preponderance of the evidence, which is, of course, a lower standard, number one. Um, number two, um, that presumes that, uh, that that precludes a motion for judgment of acquittal, which of course I would then be making as well at the conclusion of the state's case. This is just a preliminary at a lower threshold. And again, that's only determining that there's a conspiracy as to, we don't, I'm not even arguing, we don't even know which crime. I'm only assuming based on the evidence that it would be a conspiracy to commit uh, murder would be the only charge at this point, it would have to, maybe the state has more evidence, but at this point, the court would have to make that determination. And I understand what Your Honor is saying. I thought what the court said is it's up to the jury, and that's not my understanding of the law. And that's why I feel I have to make that motion, because you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a, uh, I could teach evidence, because I don't know if I'd be qualified to do that, but I believe I know the rules well enough to at least be able to raise the issue and preserve the record. And that's my concern, you know, because when it comes to something like this, hearsay also has a constitutional uh, 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 imprimatur when it comes to issues of, I can't cross-examine a deceased person. I can't cross-examine people who aren't even in the room. And, you know, I, I'm doing it to protect the record, so I just want the court to understand the reason that I feel I have to do that. Thank you. Does the state wish to respond? Judge, just that, uh, again, I wasn't offering it for a hearsay purpose. That's our position legally. Um, and I think, frankly, you know, the defense's objection with respect to the confrontation clause is not well taken at all. Um, because number one, um, if we're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted, but merely to show that Mr. Dulos was concerned about the cameras, it's not testimonial in nature, and therefore the confrontation clause is not implicated in the first instance. But uh, even assuming we were offering it for its truth, which we're not, um, there's certainly no evidence that uh, the declarant, Mr. Dulos, made this statement in anticipation of any criminal proceedings. So quite frankly, I think the confrontation clause argument is uh, severely 
be misplaced, Judge, and I'd, I'd ask that the court uh, deny the defense's motion for a mistrial. I've never experienced so many motions for a mistrial over evidentiary issues. Um, I, I'm not sure why the defense keeps moving for mistrials on evidentiary issues, Judge, but I would just ask that the court once again deny their request for a mistrial. Their objections are not well taken. Thank you. The motion for a mistrial is denied. We can bring the jury back in. I would just note, without my having object, a standing objection to the hearsay then, without my having to jump up and interrupt, if the court would at least allow that to proceed in that fashion. Well, well before we bring the jury out, the court noticed that uh, counsel did not object to certain other statements uh, that were allegedly made by Otis Dulos. And uh, essentially, uh, the court had to consider whether those statements were made during the course of and in furtherance of the conspiracy. From what the court has heard so far, from all of the hearsay that has been admitted, some of those statements were not in the course of in furtherance of the conspiracy. However, counsel did not object. Some of them might have been admitted for a reason that I, if I objected, I knew that Mr. McGinnis would have a response, especially questions. I always believe that if somebody asks something, that's not hearsay, because it's not a statement. So if I ask what time is it, that's not a statement of the time, that's just an inquiry. So there were times when, and, and there may be other reasons that if it's, if it's unimportant, I don't want to interrupt because there's also reasons not to object to everything that might be here. Well, that's interesting, Judge, because earlier when I was examining Mr. Gumini, and Mr. Dulos asked the question, is this cameras? The defense objected on grounds of hearsay. So I guess within the last 10 minutes, they've changed their position with respect to whether or not a question constitutes hearsay. I object to any sort of continuous objection, Your Honor, because as the defense aptly pointed out, this is an area where we agree, not every statement that I'm offering is for the truth of the matter asserted. In fact, much of what Mr. Dulo said is not being Your Honor, offered. Your Honor, the interpreter is going to ask counsel to slow down. Thank you. Much of what Mr. Dulos is alleged to have said in this case is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. So it need not meet any hearsay exception. So I think if counsel has an objection to specific things, then he should raise them at the time. So the state, so the record is very clear, has an opportunity to respond and indicate what the purpose of the offer is. Well, Your Honor, that's absurd because there's speaking objections that are being allowed where the, where the state is being uh, narrating what they're going to get in regardless of the court's ruling. It's on this issue of things that Mr. Dulos said that I'm asking for a continuing objection. If the record were later show that some of these statements would have been admissible under other exceptions, that's for a different court, not for this court. But for me to have to object every time that uh, hearsay is being elicited through this witness, and I'm assuming that's going to go on for the rest of his testimony, that's my concern. Well, Judge, in this court's view, a continuing objection puts the burden on the court to determine what should be objected to. The court does not carry that role. If there are objections to be made, counsel is obligated to make them. The court is not going to carry that burden that counsel can ably carry. Do you wish to be heard, counsel? No, Judge. You can bring the jury in.
Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Committee, good morning again. Good morning. <clears throat> Mr. Committee, I wanted to just go back to your 2001 Toyota Tacoma for a moment. In 2019, were the original Tacoma seats in the Tacoma? No. What types of seats were in the Tacoma in May of 2019? I believe uh, Ford Focus. Were those Ford Focus seats in the vehicle when you purchased it? No. Who put the Ford Focus seats in the vehicle? I did. Why? When I bought the car, I bought it from a uh, mechanic and they were just dirty, rip. And I decided to change them. And do you recall where you purchased the seats? It was a uh, mechanic in, in New Britain. I, I don't remember. I believe it was the same one I brought the uh, <coughs> Jennifer um, ran over to. Now, I believe where we left off prior to the break, you indicated that you had motorbiked or dirt biked with the defendant and Mr. Dulos. Is that correct? Yes. How many times did you do that? Once just with Dulos and once with Dulos and Michelle. And I believe you referred to an area as the power lines. Yes. Where is that area? So. Um, back of left, back left corner of Fort Jefferson, there was like a um, small trail that that, will, that was connecting to it. And how large was the trail? Miles. Can you describe the trail for the jury? It's a white gravel road made for. Um, um, Power line company, big trucks. And approximately when did you dirt bike with the defendant, Mr. Dulos? I can't remember. They had to be I don't know, two weeks, few few weeks before that, few maybe month. And I want to just be clear when you say before that, what are you before thinking? May twenty fourth of twenty nineteen? Incidentally, did you own a dirt bike when you came to America? No. When did you get a dirt bike? I purchased that dirt bike uh, from Michelle Tricones, um year or two prior to 2019. What type of dirt bike was it? It was um, Honda 250L, I believe. How long did the three of you dirt bike for? A few hours. Was it fun? Yeah. And was this the only time that you had sort of seen Michelle Traconis outside of a formal work event? Uh, I saw her at the um, Easter party. And like the hobby awards, but that I guess that's considered work. What are the hobby awards? There was um, meetings with all the builders that would get awarded for best project. You know. What year was this? It was happening every year. And was Four Group invited every year? Yes. And was there a year that Four Group actually got an award? Pretty much every time. And would you attend? Yes. Who else would attend? Whoever was managing it. Right, I object to the vagueness. There's no time frame over the years. Well, it would happen every year if the testimony, the witness that he worked for, the four group for a certain number of years, and the question, the court, assumes is that you go every year that's what the court would assume the, the logical question would be to respond to counsel's concern well 
Well, why don't we talk about 2019? First of all, when were the Hubby Awards typically held? When? Yeah, what month? I don't remember. Okay. Do you recall whether or not there was a Hubby Awards in 2019? I don't recall it, no. Okay. How about 2018? Yeah. And who attended in 2018, if you recall? It was me, um, Andy Lomas, Michelle Chocones, and Flores Dulos. Now, Andy Loomis, would he have been, I guess, your counterpart on another project? He was managing um, 80 Mountain Spring Road and 77 Mountain Spring Road. That was his project. In May of 2019, what were the status of 80 Mountain Spring Road and 77 Mountain Spring Road? They were finished. And when a project is finished, what happens then? It's on the market, waiting for potential buyer. And were there any realtors that Ford Group would work with usually? Yes. Um, one of them was Stefan Rich, and there was a few other ones that came and go, but I don't remember their names. Were there open houses at the projects? Yes, every now and then. And would you ever attend? Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned that you had purchased a dirt bike from the defendant. Where would you typically keep the dirt bike? Um, typically it would be at my house. And so if you kept the dirt bike at your house, where would you normally ride it? I just play around with my son a little bit on, on the backyard. Do you recall um, whether or not Mr. Dulos and the defendant invited you to dirt bike with them? Yes. Incidentally, how long had Mr. Dulos been dirt biking? He he was not an experienced uh, rider. I, I think um, he purchased his first dirt bike right after he met Michelle. Oh, right after Michelle moved into. Or, or maybe before she moved in, or around that time. After you rode uh, dirt bikes with Mr. Dulos and the defendant, what did you do with your dirt bike? I left it at Fort Jefferson Crossing in the garage. Why did you leave the dirt bike at Fort Jefferson it Crossing? It was, I was exhausted and, and just want to go home. So he says like, yeah, just leave it here. Do you remember what day of the week this was? Was it your intention to return to Fort Jefferson Crossing and take your dirt bike back to your house? When? On May 24, 2019? Yes. Did you ever tell Mr. Doulos that that's what you were planning on doing? Yes. When did you tell him this? When, uh, when we moved Tacoma to 80 Mountain Spring Road and when I was giving him a ride back, um, I told him if he's going to be there Friday evening and give me a ride back so I can get my truck back and then I can take my door bike. Did you have any conversation that day with Mr. Doulos about what he would be doing on May 24th, 2019? I believe he told me... Um, Objection, you're saying again, not applicable to my client. I am definitely not offering this for the truth, Judge. So it is not hearsay. Well, ask the question so that the court can determine whether it is What did Mr. Dulos tell you about where he would be on May 24th, 2019? Sounds like hearsay and relevance to my client. Well, what did Mr. Dulos tell you about where he would be? The response is, of course, going to come from the mouth of the declarant. And if it is here, say the court will have it stricken if it's offered for the truth. And I am not offering this for its truth, just to be very clear about this. So it is not being offered for a hearsay purpose. 
So at this point, the objection is overruled. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Julius about where he would be on May 24, 2019 in the morning hours? Yes. What did he tell you about where he would be in the morning hours on May 24, 2019? He told me um, not to stop by the office on my way to New Canaan um, between 7 and 9 o'clock because he's going to have a meeting with um, his divorce lawyer. <clears throat> And would Mr. Dulos occasionally meet with attorneys at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. And were you present at times when an attorney would come to visit with Mr. Dulos? He would always tell me to go get lunch, go check on 80 Mountain Spring Road. He did not want me to be present. And, and Was this the first time, however, that Mr. Dulos gave you advance notice that an attorney would be coming to the office? I believe so, yes. Would you routinely go to the office in the morning? No. Every Monday. Every Monday, you said? Yes. Now, we've spoken about dirt bikes. I want to talk to you now about bicycles. Did Mr. Julos own any bicycles? Yes. And was there uh, a bicycle that Mr. Dulos owned that appeared to be older? Yes. What type of bicycle was this? He told me that's, uh, that's his childhood bicycle. It was, um, I don't remember the name of it. It was French made. I'm going to object to this as hearsay. And again, it had nothing to do with my client. It's well, not in furtherance of it. Well, first, well, we'll hear from counsel first. Judge, again, I'm not offering this to prove it was, in fact, his childhood bicycle. He's indicating that this is a particular bicycle and attributing certain um, uh, facts to it. But I'm not offering those facts for the truth. It explains the description of the bicycle, which I'm about to ask. He can ask about the description. I don't think whatever Mr. Dulos may or may not said about it, whether it's worth a million dollars or worth a dollar, matters. Well, uh, the response was, or began this way, uh, Fotis Dulo said, well, previous to that response, what kind of bicycle was it? Was it an older bicycle? Yes. And so, counsel, you may continue the line. Uh, did, did you ever see this bicycle? Yes. Describe it for the jury. It was... Uh, Older French made bicycle, dark color, um, I want to say either brown or, or black, with like a, like a racing bicycle with the horns on it. Where did Mr. Julos keep this bicycle? In, in the garage in Fort Jefferson. Where would he keep it in the garage? I believe it was hanging on one of those hooks in, in, in his garage. When you say hanging on a hook, where was the hook located? There were like heavy duty hooks made for bicycles on the, attached to the garage walls. I want to direct your attention now to Friday, May 24th, 2019. That was the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, is that correct? Yes. Incidentally, does your wife um, celebrate a birthday around that time? Yes. When's your wife's birthday? May 20th. When you began your day that morning, where were you? I was home. And can you just refresh the jury's memory as to where you live? 27 Springbrook, Sinsburg. What vehicle did you have when you began your day? Ford Raptor. When you left that morning, did you take your cellular phone with you? Yes. What was your cellular phone number at the time? 
You mentioned that you had the Raptor. For how long had you had that vehicle? Almost, almost two weeks. In 2019, were you aware that the Raptor had what's known as an infotainment system? What do you mean by that? Well, are, do you know what an infotainment system is? No. Did the Raptor have the ability to hook up to Bluetooth speaker with your cell phone and things oh, of that nature? Yes. Did you know that that infotainment system tracked the GPS of the Raptor? I didn't. When you left your home in Simsbury that morning, where did you go? To straight to the job site in New Canaan. And the job site was located at 61 Sturbridge? Yes. Is it Sturbridge Hill? I believe it's Sturbridge Hill Road. On your way to 61 Sturbridge Hill Road, did you speak to anyone? Yes. On your cellular phone? Yes. Who did you speak to? Um, my and my wife's friend, Anna. Approximately how long did you speak with her for? About 20, 25 minutes. And without getting into too much of that conversation, it was about whether or not Anna was going to be attending your wife's birthday party, which was scheduled for the next day, correct? Yes. When you arrived at 61 Sturbridge, was anyone else at the location? I don't remember. Can you tell us whether or not you met up with any sub subcontractors at 61 Sturbridge that day? I, I don't remember if, if I meet with anybody at that job site. It, there's possibility that I, I met I would with. object to speculation of what's possible. Oh, well, he's, he's, he's expanding on his answer. Well, his response was, I don't remember if I met anyone, any subcontractor that day. And then the next sentence was, there's a possibility. Well, the question had been responded to. You may ask another question. Mr. Gumini, May 24th, 2019 was, at the time, just another day of work for you. Is that correct? Yes. It was Friday before a long weekend. And so because of that, have you occasionally had difficulty remembering exactly what you did on May 24th, 2019? Yes. You didn't know someday you'd be in court talking about Objection, it. leading, and argumentative. Yes. Well, it's not leading. It's not argumentative. The question is, essentially, has your memory uh, been intact about that day? That's the question. Overruled. You didn't know someday you'd be in court talking about your whereabouts on May 24th, no. 2019, correct? That is. And you never wrote a timeline about where you were on May 24th. Objection no. leading. Well, it is a corollary to the previous question. If you cannot remember, a logical corollary is, and you did not memorialize it, correct? <clears throat> you never wrote a timeline about where you were on May 24, 2019, correct? Never. At the um, stage of the project that 61 Sturbridge was in at the time, what kind of work was being done at the house, if you recall? I believe the painter was finishing painting, um, the landscaping guys were doing seeding grass and, and lens, installing plantings and things like that. Um, I was installing hardware for doors, mirrors. It was basically done. Approximately how long were you at 61 Sturbridge for? I believe I arrived around 10 o'clock. And I left 
I want to say 2.30. Did you ever meet up or see Mr. Dulos while you were in New Canaan? No. Incidentally, have you ever been to Jennifer Dulos' home in New Canaan at 69 Wells Lane? No. Did you speak with Mr. Dulos on the morning of May 24th? No. Did there come a point in time where you communicated with Mr. Dulos? Yes. Tell the jury about that communication. I believe at some point I sent him a um, text message with uh, invoice. Um, I don't remember the conversation. He 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 responded to me and he asked me what time I'm going to be back in Farmington. And I responded that it's going to be around 4.30, end of the day. And did he also ask you whether any progress had been made? Yes. Did you reply to that? I don't remember. What was the invoice for? For um, landscaping. When you say for landscaping, was there landscaping work being done at 61 Sturbridge? Yes. Who was the landscaper, if you recall? Bill Woods. Approximately what time was this exchange? Uh, I can't recall it. it. It had to be after, after lunch hours. Did you ever um, leave 61 Sturbridge that day? It's possible that I went for lunch. Who would you have gone for lunch with? Well, again, it, he only indicates possible, so then the next question would clearly not be, who did you go with if, it's, if he doesn't know if he did? I'll rephrase. You don't have a recollection as to whether or not you went for lunch, correct? I don't. Did you go for lunch uh, ever when you were working in New Canaan? Yes. Who did you go to lunch with? Um, Sydney Vienna, the painting. <clears throat> Where did you go? Um, there's Chinese restaurant <clears throat> down the road um, in New Canaan. And you don't recall whether or not it was on May 24th or a different day, correct? It's possible. After you left 61 Sturbridge, where did you go? I went back to Farmington. What vehicle were you driving? Ford Raptor. <clears throat> did you stop anywhere on the way? I believe I stopped by um, gas station across from Yukon <clears throat> in Farmington to fill up the Raptor. Okay. You've obviously driven the Tacoma and the Raptor for a few years, is that correct? Up until this point? Yeah. Did the Raptor take more gas than the Tacoma? Yes, he did. Do you recall approximately how much more gas? Um, I believe Tacoma won't take more than 17 gallons of gas on empty. Um, and the Raptor, definitely more, but I don't know how much, how much more. It has a bigger gas tank. <clears throat> Did you fill the gas tank of the Raptor? Yes. Did you get a receipt? Yes. Did you hang on to that receipt? Yes. Can you tell the jury why you hung on to that receipt? I was using a company credit card, and every end of the month I would um, give my boss do lots um, the receipts. So you paid for the gas with the company credit card? Yes. Where was this gas station located? I don't remember the address. It's, I believe it's Babu gas station or something like that. It's uh, across the street from Yukon. Yukon? Yes. In what town? Farming.
After you got gas, where did you go next? Fort Jefferson. Approximately what time did you arrive at Fort Jefferson? I want to say around 4 30, 4 40, around that time. Later on in the afternoon? Yes. And when you arrived at Fort Jefferson, can you indicate to the jury where you went? Well, actually, let me, let me ask it this way. Where, did, where, if anywhere, did you park the Raptor when you arrived at Fort Jefferson? I must have just pulled straight in between the garages into the parking area. And after you pulled straight in, did you see Mr. Dulos? No. Did you see the defendant? No. Did you see any vehicles? No. Did it appear that anyone was home? No. What did you do next? I went, um, I called Dulos to see where he is because we had an understanding that he's gonna help me get my truck that evening. He didn't answer, so I went um, into the kitchen where I would usually leave the key for the comma to see if the key is there. Um, and I saw black iPhone on the island connected and charging, so I, I thought he might forgot his phone or something. And I went upstairs to the office to look at my desk and, and his desk if he didn't leave the key for, for the truck. Um, there, and then and I didn't see him. You mentioned earlier that it was your intention to get your dirt bike on this particular day, is that correct? Yes. Was that another reason why you wanted the key to the Tacoma? Yes. Can you explain to the jury why you wanted the, tea, the key to the Tacoma so that you can bring your dirt bike home? The Tacoma had a longer bed than the Ford Raptor. Um, the Tacoma had a six foot bed. Um, and Raptor was only five feet, so I don't think the tour bike would fit in the, in the Raptor. And also, Tacoma being a smaller truck was lower, which makes it easier to load the tour bike on it. <laughs> Did you locate your key in either the kitchen or the office? No. Incidentally, how were you able to access Fort Jefferson Crossing if no one was home? I have a key <clears throat> for the office and the house. Approximately how long did you have that key for? Probably since 2016. After you weren't able to locate your keys and Mr. Dulos didn't answer his phone, what did you do next? I. Um, I took the Raptor and I went to 585 Deercliffe. And 585 Deercliffe is located approximately how far away from Fort Jefferson Crossing? It's like a um, minute away. <clears throat> now you listed off several properties earlier that Ford Group owned. Was 585 Deercliffe Road one of them? Yes. Can you describe to the jury the condition of 585 Deercliff on May 24th, 2019? It was an old house. There was um, on the market, I believe, as property only. I think the house was going to be demolished. And why did you go to 585 Deercliff? I wanted to grab um, two by 10 basically like a ramp to help me load the door bike. How did you know that there would be a 2x10 at 585 Deercliff? This is where I unload my door bike. I'm and sorry, I missed what you said, sir. This is where I unload the door bike when I brought back to Fort Jefferson. Was it your 2x10? I don't know. Could it be one from job site? Could it be one of mine? Where was the 2x10 stored at 585? In the garage. Was there anything else in the garage? Yeah. What else was in the garage? Crush, Porsche Cayenne, some um, big exterior doors, and leftover materials from job sites. Was 585 almost uh, uh, becoming a storage location for Ford Group at this the point? The garage was, yes. 
Who owned the Porsche Cayenne, if you know? I believe it belonged Objection, to... Objection, speculation, and here's something. Well, who owned the Porsche Cayenne? The court did not hear what came after that, do, if you know it. That's what the court thought it heard. He said, I believe. Well, the question, who owned the Porsche Cayenne, if you know? Was that the question, or was that not the question? That was the question, sir. Overruled. You may answer the question, Mr. Dominion. Can you repeat it, please? Who owned the Porsche Cayenne, if you know? I believe was registered on Jennifer Dulos. And you described it as crushed. What did you mean by that? It looks like someone hit a tree with it. Was the uh, Porsche Cayenne functioning at the time? No. Approxim approximately how long were you at 585 Deer Cliff at, at, during this particular trip? Um, a minute. Was the garage door open or did you need a key? It, it wasn't locked. It just left it up and opened it. If it was your intention to um, take the Tacoma home that weekend, why did you load the 2x10 into the Raptor? First, I thought I was going to um, try to load the door bike on the Raptor. But as was I, I was pulling out of um, 585, I thought maybe I'll stop by 80 Mountain Spring Road and see if the key is in the truck, or maybe Dulos is there. or. <laughs> And you mentioned that the, you wanted to see if the key was in the truck. That was where you had gone with Mr. Dulles to park the Tacoma earlier in the week. Is that right? Yeah. Was Mr. Dulos at 585 during this trip? Yes. 585. Oh, no. I'm sorry. No. Was the defendant at 585? No. Approximately how long did it take you to travel from 585 Deer Cliff to 80 Mountain Spring Road? I want to say about seven minutes. Five. Fairly quick ride? Yeah. When you arrived at 80 Mountain Spring Road, where did you go? I pulled right next to my truck. Can you just describe 80 Mountain Spring Road for the jury in terms of the driveway and its relationship to the house? So it's a it's a pretty long wavy driver. It comes in and then goes around the back of the house. And where was your Tacoma parked? Exactly the way we left it the day before. Now, 80 Mountain Spring Road has a four bay garage, is that correct? Yes. Was the Tacoma parked in front of one of the garages? Or bays, I should say? Um, no, it was it was not close to the garage. It was away from the garage. Were there any other vehicles present when you arrived? Yes. What other vehicles were present? Um, by Jeep and um, Chevy Suburban. Was Mr. Dulos present? Yes. Was the defendant present? Yes. How did Mr. Dulos react when he saw you? The way I can say it, uh, look, like surprised for a second or two. How did the defendant react when she saw you? About the same way. Where were they located? So Dulos was standing um, next to the suburban, I believe, um, by the first bay, and Michelle was way back where the Jeep was, like, I want to say 15 feet away. And just to be clear here, when we're referring to the Jeep, we're referring to the white Jeep Cherokee, correct? Yes. 
and we're referring to the suburban, we're referring to the black suburban, correct? Yes. Sir. Did the black suburban have anything on its roof? Yeah. What did it have on its it, roof? It's like a, it's like a trunk. It's, I guess it's called Tootle. Did you get out of your vehicle? Yes, I did. Well, not your vehicle, out of the Raptor, I guess. Yeah. And did you say anything to Mr. Dulos? Yeah, I made a comment about his hair. And when you say you made a comment about his hair, describe his hair for the jury. He was closely shaved. In 2019, how were you wearing your hair? Exactly the same way. So what did you say to Mr. Dulos about his hair? I, I told him, um, what are you doing? You, you, you shave your head. Um, you wear it, we're wearing dirty or work clothes. You, you're trying to be as handsome as me. And how did Mr. Dulos respond? I think he just smiled. Did you ask Mr. Dulos what they were doing at 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes, I did. And what did he say? He told me they were cleaning. Um, Michelle was, he told me Michelle was cleaning the windows and he was cleaning some stuff outside. Said. Overruled. You can continue. He told me Michelle was cleaning the windows and he was cleaning some stuff outside. How long had you known the defendant at this point? Um, Approximately. About two or three years. And isn't it true that in all those years you never saw her cleaning a project site? I never, I don't recall it. Did you see any garbage bags? No. Did you see any cleaning supplies? No. Did you ever look inside either the Suburban or the Cherokee? No. At that time, referring to your first interaction with Mr. Dulos, do you recall the defendant saying anything? I don't know. You mentioned that Mr. Dulos and the defendant initially appeared surprised to see you. Can you describe their demeanor eventually as you continue to interact with them? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. You mentioned that they initially appeared surprised to see you, correct? Yes. Did the interaction ever change? Did, did it become more normal? Yes, after I made the joke. <clears throat> and were they both acting normal at that point? Yes. What did you do next? I think I made a comment about the grass that I seeded there a few weeks prior to that. So you had done some work at 80 Mountain Spring Road? Okay, yes. Why did you seed the grass? Dulos asked me to. And was the grass sort of cornered off at all? Roped off, I guess? No, I guess when they originally seeded it, um, it didn't take off well, so I had to reseed it. What was Mr. Dulos wearing at 80 Mountain? He was wearing um, light blue jeans with holes in it um, and brown shoes. I don't remember the t-shirt. Do you recall what type of clothing the defendant was wearing? I believe she was in black leggings, kind of pants. You mentioned the grass. Um, did you and Mr. Dulos walk around the property of 80 Mountain? Yes. Can you describe for the jury what direction you went? We went around the, the front of the house and the back of the house, and we came back to the, to, the, um, to the parking. Did the two of you speak about the grass at that point? Yes. And what did Mr. Dulo say to you about the grass? 
I told him, the grass looks really good. It took off. He's like, yeah, um, you know, I think we're going to sell the house, you know. And um, it's when we went around the back patio, there was like two trucks, I want to say, tire marks when the landscaping guy was doing some work there. He left. As you were walking around the property with Mr. Dulos, where was the defendant? Uh, Michelle stayed on the on the parking spot. Approximately how long did you walk around the property with Mr. Dulos? I don't know how long does it take to walk around the house. Two minutes? Three? After you walked around the house, where did you go next? We all were standing by the first bay of the garage. Approximately how close to Mr. Dulos were you at this point? We were all next to each other. And if you could just maybe, just for the record, I mean, are we talking a couple of feet? Yes. And how far away were you from the defendant at this point? About the same distance as from Dulos, within two or three feet. And did you have a discussion with Mr. Dulos in the defendant's presence at that time? Yes. What was the discussion about? I told Dulos to, if he could give me right, um, or ride with me to, to Fort Jefferson so we can leave one of the vehicles and he can give me right back so I can get my Tacoma. Because there was four cars and three people. Was the defendant present for this conversation? Yes. Did the defendant say anything during this conversation about where she was going to be going? Yeah, after Dulos told me, yeah, let's let's uh, let's go, and then um, and I believe Michelle said that she has to go meet with some somebody about some rugs, carpets. That's what I can remember. What happened next? I got in a Raptor, um, and then I put the truck in reverse, and I look on the Tacoma, and I saw the uh, the key for my truck sticking from the passenger room. <clears throat> so I just want to be uh, clear about this. When you say sticking from your passenger door, was it in the slot for the key? Yes. Did you retrieve your Tacoma key at that point? No, because I figured I'll be back there in five, 10 minutes. So what vehicle are you driving at this point? Ford Raptor. Did you, Mr. Dulos, and the defendant all leave 80 Mountain at the same time? I left. I didn't see him in the mirror, but um, shortly after I met with Dulos at Fort Jefferson. Do you know what vehicle Mr. Dulos was driving at that point? I believe um, the Chevy's Suburban. And what vehicle was the defendant driving? Um, the white Jeep. You indicated that you left. When you left 80 Mountain Spring Road, if you're coming out of the driveway, did you make a right or a left? I don't recall if I was backing out of the driveway or I turned around on the driveway, but I would take a right towards Fort Jefferson. And where did you go next? I went to 585 Dipper. This is the home that has the Porsche Cayenne? Yes. Why did you go back to 585? I want to leave uh, the 2 by 10 there and, and my toolbox. How long did it take you to get from 80 Mountain Spring Road to 585? Five, seven minutes. Did the defendant or Mr. Dulos follow you to 585 in either of their vehicles? No. 
What did you do once you got back to 585? I unloaded the two by 10 and my toolbox, and then um, I went to four Jefferson Cross. Approximately how long were you at 585 during this trip? A minute. You indicated that you went back to Fort Jefferson Crossing. How long did it take you to get there? Another minute. Is, is 585 Deer Cliff closer to Fort Jefferson Crossing than 80 Mountain Spring Road? Yes. When you arrived at Fort Jefferson Crossing, what did you see? I saw, um, I saw the black suburban park in the, um, in the left bay in the garage. Did you see Mr. Dulos? Yes. Did you see the defendant? No. Did you see the white Cherokee? No. Can you tell us whether or not the white Cherokee was on the property at that time? I don't remember seeing it. And with respect to Mr. Dulos, what did he do when you arrived back at Fort Jefferson Crossing? I believe he was doing something with his phone, either on the uh, mudroom entry or in the kitchen. Can't remember exactly. And what happened next? Um, he got into the Raptor and we went back to 80 Mountain Spring Road. And what was the purpose of going back to 80 Mountain Spring Road? To get my truck. Do you recall at this point whether or not you were driving the Raptor or was Mr. Dulos? I don't. And approximately how long did it take you to get back to 80 Mountain Spring Road? It was about the same distance as um, 585 from 80 Mountain Spring Road, so it's five, seven minutes. When you arrived back at 80 Mountain Spring Road, was anyone present on the property besides you and Mr. Dulos initially? No. Did you see your Tacoma? Yes. Were the keys still in the passenger door of your Tacoma? No. Did you see your keys anywhere on the property at that point? No. Did you speak to Mr. Dulos about the fact that the keys were missing? Yes. What did Mr. Dulos say to you? He says that Michelle has a key. So he knew that she had the keys? That's what he told me. Yeah. Did he say anything else to you at that point? Yes, he asked me if I wanted to just keep the Raptor um, for the weekend and, and leave the Tacoma at 80. Did you want to keep the Raptor? No. Why not? I didn't know if I'm going to fit the door bike on, on a Raptor and I wanted to take the door bike home. So you were willing to try it earlier, but now that you had access to your Tacoma, you wanted your Tacoma back, is that yes. correct? Did you know that the defendant was going to be taking your keys? No. Did you tell her while you were all present at 80 Mountain Spring Road that she had permission to take your keys? No. Did she ever tell you that she was going to take your keys? No. Did Mr. Dulos ever tell you that she was going to take your keys? No. After you indicated to Mr. Dulos that you wanted your Tacoma, what happened next? I believe he called Michelle. And was that done in your presence? Yes. And did he indicate to you whether or not she would be coming back with your keys? I don't remember.
At some point, did the defendant arrive at 80 Mountain Spring Road with your keys? Yes. As you sit here, do you recall what vehicle she was driving when she arrived? No. In between the time that you believe Mr. Dulos called the defendant and when she arrived with your keys, what were you and Mr. Dulos doing, if you recall? I don't recall it. We, we, we could have um, walked down the property, um, fixing the ribbons, you know, by, by the driveway, something like that. And I can't remember if I asked you this, but how long did it take for the defendant to arrive? That's okay. I want to say between five and 10 minutes. Who actually gave your keys back to you? Dulos. And after he gave you the keys, did the three of you leave again? Yes. Which vehicles are everyone driving at this point, if you recall? I don't know what Michelle was driving. Um, I know Dulos was taking the Raptor that we came in. I'm sorry, I missed that. I know Dulos was driving the Raptor because we came with the Raptor and I was taking my Tacoma. When you got in the Tacoma, did anything seem out of place in your vehicle? I don't recall it, no. Did you see anything that appeared to be blood in the vehicle? No. Did, where did you go after leaving 80 Mountain Spring Road? I went to 585 Dirkut. Did anyone follow you to 585 for this Dulos trip? Did. Why did he follow you to 585? I was going to leave my Tacoma at 585 Deercliff, and uh, he needed to give me a ride back to Fort Jefferson. And why were you going back to Fort Jefferson? To get to Dubai. How were you planning on getting the dirt bike to 585? I just drove it. Did the defendant go back to 585 with you and Mr. Dulos? No. When you got back to um, strike that, did you and Mr. Dulos travel back to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes. Approximately how long did that take? From? From 585. A minute. And when you got to Fort Jefferson Crossing, what did you do? I, um, I was having trouble starting the door bike, so I had to use the battery booster to start it. I was playing around with that for a little bit. <laughs> did Mr. Dulos help you with the dirt bike? Yes. How did he help you? He gave me the battery booster and like basically stand next to me. On all of these trips, um, including when you were with Mr. Dulos and the Raptor, and when he was assisting you at Fort Jefferson Crossing with the dirt bike, can you describe his demeanor for the jury? It was normal, calm. Did you see the defendant at Fort Jefferson Crossing at this point when you're jump starting the dirt bike? I don't recall it, no. How long did it take you to jumpstart the dirt bike? I don't remember. Did you get it started eventually? Yes. And what did you do with it? I drove it to 585 Dirt Club. And after you got back to 585 Dirt Club with your dirt bike, what did you do? 
I load it on the back of my Tacoma, strap it down, put the 2x10 right next to it, and went down to Sainsbury. Did you go home immediately? No. Where did you go first? <clears throat> um, I stopped by my neighbor's house. He called me um, earlier and asked me, he was gonna be away for the weekend and he asked me if I could, if he could show me a lot around for that weekend, um, he's gonna want me to let his dog out because he's not gonna be home. And did you do so? No. Why not? I think they had some conversation with his wife and, and he told me to come back later. Now, Mr. Gumini, I, I want to talk to you now about an agreement that you have with the state's attorney's office. Yes. Are you familiar with that agreement? Which one? The grant of immunity? Yes. Now, Mr. Gumini, in 2019, did you retain the services of an attorney? Yes. And what's the name of your attorney? Lindy Urso. How did you um, get referred to Mr. Urso? I don't remember. Um, it was one of Dulos' lawyers. When you say one of Dulos's lawyers, you're not meaning that Mr. Urso is one of Dulos's lawyers, correct? No, no, it was referred to me by one of Dulos's lawyers. And in 2019, um, Mr. Urso had a conversation with then state's attorney Colangelo, is that correct? Yes. And state's attorney, former state's attorney Colangelo indicated that you may not be charged with the crime of hindering prosecution if you agree to cooperate with the investigation and prosecution of others in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Farber Dulos on May 24, 2019. Is that correct? I believe that was verbal agreement at that time, yes. And more recently, specifically on December 4th, 2023, the current state's attorney, Mr. Forensic, put that agreement in writing. Is that correct? Yes. May I have the smart Friday? Yes. Judge, this is States 124. I don't think there's an objection. Set the original. Or just a copy. No. I have no objection. States 124 admitted as full. Okay, I'm gonna, if I may, Your Honor, just. <clears throat> I haven't endeavored with this machine yet, Judge, so Attorney Manning's going to help me. Mr. Gumini, have you seen this document before? Yes. <clears throat> and is this the uh, grant of immunity from my boss, State's Attorney Forensic, to you in connection with this case? Yes. And it indicates that you will not be prosecuted in connection with this case unless you perjure yourself or act in contempt of court. Is that correct? Yes. Just returning 124 to the clerk. 
What did you do on the evening of uh, May 24th, if you recall? I'm sorry, can, I, can you repeat the question? Sure, May 24th, 2019, after you got home, do you recall what you did? No. I want to direct your attention now to that Saturday, May 25th, 2019. Did you and your family have plans? Yes. And what were those plans? It was my wife's birthday party. Earlier in the day, um, had you had any communications about selling a lawnmower? Yes. Tell the jury about that. I have an ad on uh, Craigslist, I believe, or that was... Um... Your Honor, I'm going to object on relevance ground. I don't think this has anything, it certainly has nothing to do with my client or anything that has anything to do with the case. Well, the court does not know where this line leads, so the court is going to allow some leeway overruled. You remember it was on May 25th? Yes, I'm pretty sure. And you indicated you had an ad on Craigslist? I believe it was offer up for Craigslist. And did you actually sell the lawnmower that day? Yes. Who did you sell it to, if you recall? I don't. Is it a male or a female? Male. And approximately what time of day was this? Again, Your Honor, it, it, well, was, it has nothing to do with anything. Well, we don't know that, counsel. The court is going to ask counsel, where is this going? Well, I'm just uh, describing his day, Your Honor. It is getting to a phone call that he receives. I'm just walking the jury through the day. Well, that is not relevant. Sustained. Do you recall what time your wife's birthday party started? I believe people will start coming in around lunchtime. And did you receive a phone call from Mr. Julius on the 25th? Yes, I did. And approximately what time of day was this, if you recall? It had to be in the afternoon. Do you remember what Mr. Hulo said to you? That he doesn't have his phone to call him on this phone from now on. Did he say anything to you about Jennifer Dulos at that point? No. I want to direct your attention now to Sunday, May 26th. Did you receive another phone call from Mr. Dulos? Yes. Do you recall approximately what time of day you received this phone call? It had to be in the afternoon. And was he calling you from that new phone number that he'd given you the night before? I believe so. Describe that conversation for the jury. Dulles told me that um, um, Jennifer is missing. Um, that. Um, I don't recall exactly the conversation. Um, he said that he wishes that she's gonna show up, that that would show that she's not um, capable of overseeing the kids. And, um, and he was asking me when I'm gonna be back and work to work. Were you surprised when he asked you that? I'm going to object to his, to that, Your Honor. I'll rephrase. I'll rephrase. Was Monday supposed to be a scheduled off day for four group? Yes. And was that in recognition of the Memorial Day holiday? Yes. So given that you had a scheduled off day, what did you say to Mr. Dulles about when you'd be returning to work? Tuesday.
did you see either Mr. Dulos or the defendant the weekend of May 25th, 26th, and including the holiday 27th? No. I want to uh, direct your attention now to Tuesday, May 28th, the day that you returned to work. Yes. How did you get to work? I drove my Tacoma. And do you recall whether or not this is the first time you'd operated it since Friday? I don't recall it. Approximately what time did you arrive at work? Around 8 o'clock in the morning. And just to be clear, when we say work, you're not driving directly to a project site. You're going to the office at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Is that correct? Yes. When you arrived at Fort Jefferson Crossing at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, May 28th, where did you go? I I went into the kitchen um, for Jefferson Crossing. Yeah. Why did you go into the kitchen? To ask Dulles what vehicle I'm taking and give him the key to, to my Tacoma. And was this your routine every Monday? Yes. Unless I saw him in the office. I'm sorry? Unless I saw him in the office. When you um, got to the kitchen, who did you see? I saw Fortis Lewis and Michelle Tupont. And where were they located? They were standing in the kitchen. And can you just describe the kitchen for the jury? Um, so when you walk into the kitchen from the mudroom, there's a big island kitchen and dining room. Dining table. And where were they standing? They were standing right next to the island. And did you have a conversation with Mr. Doulos and the defendant? Yes. What did Mr. Doulos say to you? Doulos told me that um, Jennifer is still missing. And um, I believe Michelle said uh, that it, 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 it could be the lawyers, they, they're playing games. And so after the defendant said it could be the lawyers playing games, did Mr. Dulo say anything else? He asked me where was I on Friday. How did you re respond to that? I told him that I was in New Canaan. Are you surprised that he was asking you that? Yeah. What else did he say? He asked me if there was um, any contractors with me. And I told him that I think yes, but I'm not sure. And did he say anything about writing down your whereabouts? I'm going to object leading and hearsay. Well, sustained on leading. What else did Mr. Dulo say to you? He asked me if I was calling him this, that morning. I'm sorry? He was asking me if I was calling him that morning. <clears throat> calling him from your phone? Yes. And after he asked you this, what did he do? I, I said, I don't remember. Let me look on my phone. And um, I pulled my phone out. And I started looking on it. And he asked me if he can, if he can see it. And what happened next? So I, I hand him my phone and, and he started looking through my calling history, I guess. Approximately how long did he have your phone? I want to say a few minutes, five minutes. And how far away was he from you when, you, when he had your phone? About six feet. What's the defendant doing as Mr. Dulos has your phone? She was standing right next to me. Did Mr. Dulos ever bring up writing a timeline? Yes. 
Tell the jury about that portion of the conversation. He told me that um, um, police took his phone, uh, that he spoke with his attorney, and he told them to to write down timeline. And um, he told me to look through my phone and and write down where I was, who I was, why we throughout the day. <clears throat> What did you say when he told you to write down where you were throughout the day? I was surprised. I told him, and what am I going to do if police is going to come over and ask me? I'm going to pull out a piece of paper and read it to them. So you did not agree to write a timeline? No. Did you find it strange that he was asking you to write a timeline in the first Objection place? relevance. Oh. Did you find it strange that he was asking you to write a timeline in the first place? Yeah, that's what, that's why I responded that way. After you told Mr. Dulos that you wouldn't be writing a timeline. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? After you told Mr. Dulos that you would not be writing a timeline, did the defendant say anything? Yes, Michelle said uh, she's not gonna write it either. Approximately how long did this conversation between the three of you last? Um, the whole conversation? Yes, sir. Fifteen minutes. And after the conversation ended, did you give Mr. Dulos the key to your Tacoma? Yes. What did you do next? You mean? Well, let, let me uh, let me back up. The conversation ends at some point, correct? Yes. And then what do you do next? Um, I was asking him what vehicle I'm taking, and um, after going back and forth with Michelle, he told me to take the Jeep. The white Jeep Cherokee. Yes. Incidentally, did you prefer the white Jeep Cherokee? Yes. Why? It was smaller, quieter vehicle. The married parkway that I was driving to and from work, it's a narrow road. This is probably a good place to stop yes, for a lunch and recess. Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume at 2 o'clock. Please do not discuss the case.